Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. I got a couple things I want to let you know about before we get into the message today. First of all, we just wrapped up our week of VBS. This is our first in-person VBS in a number of years, and let me tell you, it was a fantastic week. It was so good to hear kids singing and shouting and laughing, just having a wonderful time in our building this week. Uh, During the moment where we ask kids if they want to accept Jesus as their forever friend, let me tell you, every single hand in the room went up. The kids were hungry to meet with God and eager to, um, to t- accept and take in all that we were teaching about who Jesus is this week. In fact, a number of uh, parents were posting on social media that throughout the day their kids, were, their kids were reciting the bottom lines for the day, the big takeaways, the things they learned about God creating them with a purpose and, and all those other things that they took home this week. So it was just a wonderful week. Kids met with God. They had great time with each other. They had fun. I want to thank all of our volunteers and leaders that really gave them themselves this week. It was just a great week, and we look forward to uh, the kids camp coming up and more wonderful in-person activities for people of all ages. Uh, speaking of kids, well, you know, something exciting coming up this fall. We've seen a number, uh, uh, we've seen a great increase in the number of families and kids coming out to church on a Sunday in the last uh, weeks and months. So coming in September, we're looking to expand what we offer for kids ministry on a Sunday morning. Currently, we offer nursery, and then we have all the rest of the kids from age 3 up to age 10 in one kids ministry program. We recognize that that worked for reopening last year, but as we begin to get an increased number of kids on site, we really need to expand what we offer. So we are planning to expand to three different areas this fall. We'll con- keep nursery, then we'll have a preschool area, and then a school-age area. Now, of course, you hopefully recognize that in expanding the number of areas, it does require more volunteers to serve in those areas. So I want to encourage you now as we're getting ready for this to begin to just prayerfully consider where you can serve and where you can get plugged in this fall. And kids especially is an area of great need because we want to we want to really impart the truths of God to these kids. Make sure they have a wonderful time when they're here on a Sunday morning. That requires committed and loving and wonderful volunteers uh, such as yourselves to to be available in those areas. So just begin to prayerfully consider where you can serve this fall and if the expansion of our kids' ministry program is an area that you can get plugged into. Uh, If you have any questions or want to know more, please talk to myself uh, or Victoria Williams. We'd love to let you know more about what's happening. And then the last thing I'll let you know about, I hope you've been enjoying our More Than Shallow series this summer. We've got something special coming up on Sunday, August 21st. We're kind of going to play around with the general Sunday morning format that morning. Uh, That morning, I'm going to speak briefly on the idea of testimony and the power of our own stories. Uh, And I want to allow our stories as a church to really be the message that morning. So we're going to give opportunity on Sunday, August 21st, for a number of people to be able to share either short one, two-minute snippets or longer, maybe five-minute stories on what God's been doing in your life recently, a testimony of what he's been doing, or maybe something he's done in the past, uh, an area that you overcame in or somewhere that he intervened and really revolutionized your life, we want to hear from you and hear your story. So if you're interested in being a part of what we're doing on Sunday, August 21st, if you want to allow your story to be part of the message that day, uh, please message me, give me a call in the church office, let me know if you'd like to be a part of it. I'd love to chat with you about that and get you involved. Uh, Message is coming up next, but first I'm going to invite Sharon Bulger, our church council chair, to join us for a special announcement. Hey, church. We have been so blessed to have Tara Tetzel as the Hilltop Director for quite a number of years. And the Hilltop Ministry is such an integral part of who we are here at Sunshine Hills. Uh, And so we have got a really important announcement for you today. Tara recently returned from maternity leave. And after much consideration, uh, she has made a very hard decision. uh, But she has decided to put in her resignation from Hilltop as the director um, because she's living in Chilliwack and the commute is really far with her two young ones. And she just really feels the need to refocus and spend that time at home, uh, which we, you know, we really, we get as parents ourselves. So We're really um, so grateful for Tara and the incredible work that she's done at Hilltop over the years, um, and we're certainly going to miss all of her contributions. Yeah, Sharon said, uh, it's been so wonderful to work with Tara, and I just want to publicly thank her for all the work she's done with Hilltop and really pushing that ministry forward and keeping us its good name in the community. It's such an incredible outreach and influence in our local community, and we just really value all the work she's done to really make Hilltop what it is today. And we're going to miss her uh, greatly. So as a church, we want to be praying for Tara and for her family just in this transition. It's, it's a lot for them personally to make this decision. So we can just pray God's blessing over them and his leading 
into the next uh, part of their adventure together as a family. And of course, we want to be praying as a church body for God to bring the right new director towards us. So we have been posting the job, and we have not got a ton of hits yet. So we just want as a church really rally around this great need and pray the right person into the role. We want to ask you, our church, we want to call on you to really help us uh, to mine your own contacts. And let us know if you have people that you know that would be interested and qualified for it. We'll be posting the job description and some more information on the church Facebook group, as well as the church website. Of course, come talk to myself or Sharon. We'll be happy to answer any questions. We really want to just lift up this prayer need now and uh, really as a church rally together around this, this need and believe that God has the right next person to push Hilt up into its next phase of uh, just blessing and success in our community. So you just join me uh, in praying right now. God, we just thank you so much uh, for Tara. We thank you for Hilltop. Uh, we thank you that she has been obedient to your call on her life and for your leading and directing for her and her family. So God, we pray your blessing over her and her husband, John, and her kids right now. Uh, this is a big shift for them as well. So we just pray that you just bless them in all that's happening. Would you really help um, them to rally together as a family? And God, we pray blessing over their family that uh, she would really be just be able to pour into her two uh, beautiful young girls uh, and they would really just be able to put, uh, put down good, solid roots in Chilliwack. And they would be a huge blessing in that community. God, we just pray blessing blessing, blessing over them and their family. And God, we pray now that you just begin to just draw the right person to us uh, to be the next director of Hilltop. God, we, just per, uh, we know, we believe that you have that person in store for us. So we just pray now that you just lead us and direct us who that person is. Um, God, we just pray that you would just give us uh, insight on where best to post, uh, who best to talk to, what contacts to make. And God, we just believe that you have a plan. Uh, and your plan's a good one. So help us to trust you in this uh, next phase. And God, we look forward uh, to hopefully soon announcing to everyone who the next director will be. So I always ask and we pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right. Thank you, church. We'll be, uh, you'll be hearing more about this in the weeks to come, of course. And like I said, if you have any questions, please come talk to any one of us. We'd be happy to answer anything that you have for us. And with that, church starts now. Well, good day, church. This is now week four of our summer series, More Than Shallow. Hope you've been enjoying the different voices that have been bringing the word over the last few weeks. I know that I have. And of course, by enjoying, what I mean is I hope you've been learning. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been challenged to take your faith to a deeper level. I just want to say thanks once again to, to Erica, uh, to Brandon and Marcy, to Matthew for starting us off so strong this summer. Now, if you're just joining us today for the first time, a quick refresher to get you caught up to speed. We are made for more than shallow. That's our overarching theme for this summer. But all too often, we're content to stay where it's comfortable and never venture out into the deeper things that God has for us. We like what we know. We're, we're happy with what works. But there's a good chance that we're missing out on all that God has for us. So back in week one, Erica walked us through what it looks like to live a fruitful life by, by cultivating the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Uh, Marcy and Brandon spoke with us about walking with a limp, learning to find joy in the challenging seasons of life. And just last week, Matthew challenged us to create space, talking about being purposeful in, 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 in our making time for God and in making the most of our time with God. If you missed any of those messages, be sure to head over to our YouTube channel to get all caught up. They're all there, and they're all fantastic. And that brings us to today, and a message that has been brewing inside of me for a while now, because it's one that God has been speaking to me about personally and challenging me in. In fact, both this message and the next one that I'm working on for this summer reflect areas in my own life that God is asking me to go deeper in. Not really surprising then that uh, that's what he would kind of lead me towards with this theme. So really, I'm preaching to myself today, and I'm inviting all of you to join me on this journey. I'd like to speak today on the topic of generosity. What does it mean to be generous? What does generosity look like? How can generosity revolutionize certain aspects of our lives? Or to put it another way, as the title of today's message states, I want to be caught open-handed in how I live my life. Now, let me call something out right from the start. Some of you are hearing where we're going, and you're about to check out on me, because you're thinking, ah, this is that money talk. Right there in the middle of summer, there's that money talk. But I want to I want to encourage you, stay with me, okay? Does generosity touch on money? Of course it does. We can't really separate those ideas. 
Should we talk about how we spend and steward our financial resources? Of course we should. It's a very biblical principle and concept. Will today's talk just be about money? No. We have plenty and plenty to hit on. The principle of generosity can be applied in a variety of areas in our lives. So please don't check out on me, okay? Stay with me all the way through. And here's our starting point. Giving is an action, but generosity is an attitude. In the theme of being made for more than shallow, I want to move past the action. I want to move past the place we always go to, the shallow end. I want to focus on the attitude. I want to focus on the deeper principle, the deeper concept. So let's pray, and then we'll begin to just unpack what this looks like. God, thank you for a chance today to once again open your word and, and hear you speak to us. God, I pray today as we look to an idea, a principle, one that can really, I believe, revolutionize what it means to live. God, I pray that you'd speak to us very clearly from your word. I pray that you would remove any distraction. I pray that my words would not get in the way. And God, I pray that we would um, hear your heart, hear your words, and be challenged to go deeper in this incredibly vital area of generosity. We ask and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so in your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And get some quick context before we read the text, though. Uh, 2 Corinthians is a letter. It's one of many letters that was written by Paul uh, to, the variety, to the various churches that he uh, visited and ministered in in the early church. Uh, so this is lit- written to the church in the city of Corinth. And at this time, in his travels, Paul had established a collection of funds to support the poor from the Jerusalem church. And he had encouraged churches throughout, the, the, throughout Asia to give. The church in Corinth was one that had started to give, but had not completed or fulfilled the pledge of the amount they had, they had promised to give towards the poor in Jerusalem. So Paul, knowing this, sees a teaching moment. And he writes the church in the second letter uh, and takes some time to explain his beliefs about giving. And yes, I, I know that in context, this passage is speaking about financial giving. But more than that, he is really articulating the biblical principle, the biblical understanding of generosity. And with that, the deep spiritual blessings that are gained when we cultivate an attitude in our hearts and our minds and our spirits of generosity. So we're going to pick up 2 Corinthians chapter 9, picking up in verse 6. And today I'm reading from the New International Version. Paul writes this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly, will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will will result in thanksgiving to God. So I want to unpack what's being communicated in this text and then use that knowledge to begin to broaden out this conversation about generosity with the goal of today being this, to demonstrate the breadth of areas in your life and mine that will benefit from a generous attitude and an open-handed mindset. All good? Okay, let's go. In case you're interested, tomorrow is Christmas in July. Merry Christmas, everyone. Now, I only mention that for one reason, and it's to justify using a Christmas illustration in the middle of summer. Uh, Timing really worked out well for me on that one. So Eric and I, we have this Christmas shopping tradition. We head south during the week of American Thanksgiving in November every year to take advantage of all the Black Friday uh, deals and to maximize our ability to give gifts to our kids and our extended family. And one year while we were standing in line for a store with a ton of other people, I realized that we were in the minority. I'll never forget this moment. It was very impactful to me. From the conversations we were having with people in the line or the ones we were overhearing, it was painfully obvious that the majority of people in line were there to purchase for themselves, not for others. 
they had they had left Thanksgiving dinner early and rushed to the nearest Best Buy or Walmart or Target to stand in line to buy more stuff for themselves, not to look at ways they could bless other people. It was a spirit of selfish gain as opposed to one of loving generosity. And I don't share this to puff me and Eric up and be like, well, we're, we're the best examples of generosity. C- because we're not. Trust me, this principle has been a struggle, especially for me, and I'm going to talk about more, about, more about that in a minute. But I, I share this, this brief story to paint the picture that in general, in our culture, I have not found generosity to be a concept that is promoted, encouraged, or even celebrated. There's a lot of emphasis on saving, on investing, on taking care of yourself, but not a lot of emphasis on giving things away and living generously. And yet, in the Word of God, the positive result of a generous attitude is so clearly laid out and articulated and portrayed, especially here in Paul's letter. So let's just break down that section verse by verse Picking up right at the beginning, it says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Generosity begets generosity. God promises you and me a good return on our generous investment. And he uses the illustration of a farmer to illustrate the principle as clearly as possible. You know, if you're a farmer and you only plant a few seeds in the ground, you're only going to have a super small, if not non-existent crop, come harvest time. But if you plant a generous amount of seed, or a ridiculously over-the-top amount of seed, you're going to have an extravagant, sizable, and notable crop come harvest time. In so many areas of our lives, we will reap in proportion to what we sow. So we need to be sowing generously. Next, Paul says this, he says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And in that one line there, we see three things that are key to generosity. First of all, give what you have decided to give. Generosity is purposeful. Generosity is, is thought out and intentional. It's not a casual thing. It's not like, a, oh, whenever I feel like it, I might be generous. Generosity is planned, and we can actually structure our lives in a way to be consistently generous. Second thing we see there is that generosity isn't forced, it's not coerced, it's not reluctant. And if it is any of those things, then it's not generosity anymore. It's something else. Ultimately, generosity comes from a place of joy. I love this. The Greek word used here that we read as cheerful is the root for our English word hilarious. A generous heart is a heart that gives happily, a heart that gives with delight. In other words, we're being encouraged to be hilarious givers. And you might be like, what, is, what does it mean to be a hilarious giver? Here's how, I, here's how I understand that. To be a hilarious giver is this. In the eyes of the world, in the eyes of those who don't understand what it means to be generous, it should be laughable how generous and open-handed we are. It should be hilarious to them how much we are willing to give way in the spirit of generosity. God is more concerned with how we give than what we give. Our attitude is more important than our amount. And this principle, it really does apply in every area, not just financial giving. That our attitude is more important than the amount and how we give is more important than what we give. The next part that Paul gets to, he says, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. When you are generous, God blesses you with abundance. He will make sure that you will have enough for your own needs and enough to continue in generosity. I love that. I love that he says, if you are generous, you will have all that you need. And you will also have enough to keep being generous. I'm going to give you all that you need and then some so you can keep on being generous. Generosity does not lead to lack. In our human mindset, we go, if I give, if I give everything away, I'm going to have nothing. But generosity does not lead to lack. Generosity leads to abundance. We're going to touch on that a little bit more later. Because ultimately, generosity is the birthplace of contentment. God promises having all that you need at all times. Generosity is the birthplace of contentment. 
And then Paul goes on, he says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. If you caught, there's, there's a subtle flip in how Paul's speaking. And in these last couple of verses, he actually flips from teaching the principle to praying blessing over the church. You know, his prayer is, Now to he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food uh, will they also supply and increase. There's two words there. Supply and multiply. Paul is praying, God, would you supply this church with the resources they need to be generous? And would you then multiply those resources? Because ultimately, God is the source that our generosity taps into. Our generosity doesn't tap into to finite, limited human resources. Our generosity taps into the resources of God. And then Paul goes on and says, that, you know, I pray that you will enlarge the harvest. Church, God can do more with what we give than anything we could hope or imagine. He will enlarge the harvest of our good work and our good deeds. And then Paul continues the prayer. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So Paul says, God, may, you, may the church be enriched. May, may they be enriched in every way. And the truth of it there is generosity enriches us spiritually and materially. It enriches us in, in every way. And he says, I pray that they would be enriched for two reasons. One, so they can be more generous, because generosity begets generosity. And the second one is, for the glory of God. May they be generous, may they be enriched, for the glory of God. In his translation of the New Testament, Bible scholar J.B. Phillips carries, the sense, carries this sense into the prayer. He rewrites it like this. He who gives the seed to the sower and turns that seed into bread to eat, will give you the seed of generosity to sow, and for harvest, the satisfying bread of good deeds done. The more you are enriched by God, the more scope there will be for generous giving. And your gifts administered through us will mean that many will thank God. Church, there is no risk in generous giving. For God will always reward the giver with all that is needed for his own needs and enough to give to every good work. We serve the God of plenty. And his desire is for us to cultivate an attitude, a lifestyle of generosity. But what if? What if if there's not enough? What if I I run out? What if I'm so generous that I'm left with nothing? What if if God doesn't come through on his end? What, what 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 if what? These are the questions we constantly ask ourselves. But but what if what, church? Either we believe the promises of God or we don't. We don't serve a God that lacks. We serve the God of abundance. We serve the God of plenty. And if you look at Scripture, in a variety of areas, he is described as having more than enough. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 11, we read, The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. In Psalm 145, verse 7, we are, we are encouraged to celebrate the abundant goodness of God. In Romans 5, 17, we are told of his abundant provision of grace. Do you see a theme developing here? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches. Not according to his lack, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And then Malachi 3.10, this is the, the, the famous tithing verse. But look at the promise here. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. You've probably heard it said before. This is the one place where God says, test me in this. Don't believe me? Test me in it. Don't think I'm going to come through? Test me in it. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. It is consistently promised throughout Scripture that we serve a God of abundance. And perhaps David says it best in Psalm 23. I'm going to use the old King James where he says, My cup runneth over. We serve an abundant God who delights in blessing his children. But let's be honest, we live between two kingdoms. We get caught in this clash, heavenly and earthly, infinite and finite, abundance and scarcity. You see, if giving is an action and generosity is an attitude, then abundance is a mindset. 
We have to choose to set our minds on the things above. We have to choose to think, to see, to perceive, to believe the spiritual reality of God's kingdom. You know, I'll be honest, this tension, this struggle between abundance and scarcity is one that I know all too well. In our family, uh, I'm the one who manages the, the finances of the family. And uh, Erica can attest to this. The amount of times where I do the budget and come to her, I'm like, well, we got some, got some good news and some bad news. What do you want to hear? Like, I, I never frame it positively, right? Or uh, my, her, favorite, her favorite is I will, like, do, like, some brief, like, really rough calculations. Be like, well, babe, I haven't, I haven't finished it yet, but, like, it, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. And, like, an hour later, she'll hear me go, oh, that's weird. And she's like, oh, yeah? What's weird? I'm like, I, I, somehow the math worked out and we're, we're really good right now. She's like, oh, oh, are we? Yeah, okay. You know, she probably has lost count, count of the number of times where I have looked at financial figures and been like, well, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. And then sometime later, whether it's weeks or months or even years later, the thing that I said we can't to, but I ultimately found a way to, to kind of make work, is not even like a thought anymore. It's not like a thing that I marked, like, oh, our life really went south after that thing where I said we can't, but we try to do it. Like, all those things where I said we can't to, weeks, months, years later, not even a blip on my radar. Not even a blip on my radar. You know, oftentimes I recognize I've been stingy with my possessions. You know, I want to be like, it's mine. It's, I'm, I'm particular with my stuff. I, I don't want to lend things out and have it come back like damaged or, or not have it come back. And it's like, you know, Erica says before, it's often that the voice of the Holy Spirit in my ear going, but give it to someone. Let someone borrow it. It's going to be okay. It's not going to wreck your life if something comes back a little bit dinged or not quite how you lent it out. Like, it's going to be okay. Like, be generous. Don't be scarce and stingy in your thinking. And even when it comes to things like my time, you know, all the time I'm like, well, when do, when do, I, get to think, when do I get to do the things that I want to do? You know, I have, I have a plan for the week. What do you mean we're going to change the plan? Like, we only have so much time. We can't, we can't reimagine everything. I catch, I catch myself all, these time, all this time in these stingy, scarce mindsets, but I recognize, you know, I need to flip. I need to think abundantly. I need to think generously. A scarcity mindset convinces us that there is an end to the resources, that everything is in short or limited supply. And when we start thinking this way, we begin to live in a way that gathers and holds on to as much as we can. You know, there's, there's no room for generosity because we're worried about, about letting go and not having enough. But when we live like this, we, we tire ourselves out. Our minds just live in constant worry and our, our knuckles end up white from the death grip we have on everything. Ultimately, living with a scarcity mindset, we just suck all the joy and fun out of life. But when we shift our perspective and adopt the mindset of abundance, we discover freedom and fullness of life. The abundance mindset recognizes that God is the ultimate supply of all things, and his supply doesn't run dry. We serve the God of infinite resource. And when we start thinking this way, we begin to live in a way that releases and gives away. Generosity flourishes in a mindset of abundance because we know that whatever we give will never run out. You know, I have to laugh because we're often taught to, like, you know, get, get your piece of the pie. We're all, we're all scrambling for our piece of the pie because there's only so much pie to go around. You need to get a hold of your piece and not let it go. You know, that's what we're sold on, right? <laughs> and the image I have in my head is laughing to me is that, that God just come up in heaven in front of some sort of, like, heavenly oven with, a, with an apron on. He's like, what are you guys doing? I got a whole bunch more pies in the oven right now. Like, what are you doing fighting over that one? I got a bunch more ready to go. He's just... He's just up there with this endless supply of resources he just bless us with. And we're, we're down here fighting over one pie. And he's like, I got, I got more in the oven. So how will you live? Will you live close-fisted, trying to hold on to as much as possible, believing that there will never be enough? Or will you choose to live open-handed, generous in all things, knowing that the more you give, the more that God will provide? You know, as a church, as a, as a people, who proclaim faith in Jesus Christ, we must choose the mindset of abundance. To choose anything else, really, let's be honest, is to call God a liar and to, to deny his ability to provide. Our mindset matters. Now, now we're going to come to the payoff from how we think to what we do. And I want to get really practical and look at generosity in action. You know, what does generosity look like in the real world? When you look at the day, the week, the month ahead of you, where can you choose to be generous? 
You know, money and financial resources, that's the obvious one. And in keeping with our metaphor for the summer, that's, that's the shallow end. And I say it's a shallow end not because it's easy or because we've perfected it, not because we don't need to do it, but, but shallow because anytime we talk about generosity, the first thing we go to is money, right? It's, it's the easy out. It's the shallow way of thinking. It's why I called it out at the beginning because it's, it's the expected application. You hear their generosity, you go, oh, money message, it's, it's expected we're going there. Now, I'm not going to give us a pass on this. I'm going to go to some other places. But I'm not going to give us a pass on this. We do need to be generous with our finances. You know, tithing is important. Funding outreach projects and supporting missionaries like Brandon and Marcy who were here a couple weeks ago, that is an important use of our finances. Helping out our family and, and friends that we have that are in need, that's important. Blessing our kids financially and not, not raising them in an environment of being stingy and scarce, that's important as well. Any financial gain that I have, I recognize it's from God. It's his resources, not mine. So I might as well use what he's given me to fund things that align with his heart. How we use our money and our finances, it matters. And we need to be generous in those areas. But there are other areas to be generous in as well. Next up, possessions, our, our material assets. You know, the Bible encourages us to share with others what we have. Acts chapter 4, verse 32, the early church in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 gives the prime example of what it means to just share with no question and no expectation. Acts 4, 32 says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. You know, what a beautiful picture. No one claimed ownership or possession. Everybody just made sure that everybody was taken care of. You know, it's that somewhat now almost archaic image of like running out of eggs or flour and going to your neighbor and being like, hey, can I, can I borrow a scoop of flour or a couple eggs? Like, that almost seems like an ancient practice, but like, I know it still happens. Every so often we text our neighbors and be like, we're out, can you help? And we're like, oh, absolutely we can help. Like, that's just a simple way of just like reaching out a helping hand and, and not holding on tight to our possessions. You know, lending out a good book. You know, I always laugh when somebody, like, raves about this book they read, but then, like, never offers to, like, share it with anybody else. Like, if it's that good, can, can I borrow it for a second? You know, recycling old furniture. We live in a world where it's just, like, out with the old, in with the new. Well, just because it's old to you doesn't mean that it's not going to be new to someone else, right? Like, learning how to, to, to pass on what we've used and loved well to someone else who now needs to use it and love it well, right? I remember this crazy story. You want to go from, like, simple to extreme. Francis Chan one of my favorite pastors, wonderful author, he tells this story of, I think he was in Mexico. And I can't remember if it was someone that he knew or just a stranger he picked up. I'm not sure it matters. But he was in Mexico, was driving his car, and, and ended up picking someone up that needed a ride somewhere. And he drove him to the place, and as he was driving this person, he, you know, he's asking, you know, what, what's your story? Tell me about yourself. And it came out this guy, he, he really needed a car. The big thing he needed, he had no vehicle, he had no way to get to work, he had no way to get where he needed to go. He really needed a car, and in that moment, Francis just heard God nudge him and be like, hey, it's not your car anyways. It's, it's my car. Just give him the car. We'll figure it out. So Francis um, gets the guy where he needs to go and goes, hey, uh, let me tell you something. You can, you can have this car. One condition. Can you drive me to the border first? <laughs> can you take me back home and then the car is yours? Sure enough, the guy drove Francis Chan back to the border to the U.S., and then drove away in a brand new car, and Francis walked back into the U.S. and was like, well, God, gave that one away. I guess you're going to bring a new one my way. I, that way of thinking about things, that everything we have really isn't ours. It's just God's. It's, it's tools and resources in our hands for a momentary period of time for the, the ultimate goal of is giving away and blessing someone else. It's a revolutionary way to think uh, and to, to experience generosity. You know, another area we can learn to be generous in is the area of our time. You know, how many of us look at our calendars and think, I have no time for anything? Just, it's just all packed. I have no time for anything. And because of this, we often become very protective of our time, right? And please hear me. It is important to have healthy boundaries, obviously. But we can become very protective, almost selfish with our time. And I truly believe we need to learn how to be generous with our time. And that can look like just being available and being present in the moment, making the most of our time. You know, I think about, like, for those with kids, it's so important to be generous with our time in regards to our kids. You know, a couple of years ago, I saw someone post, like, you only have 18 summers with your kids before they, they can just kind of leave and go on their own way. 
And, uh, you know, with our oldest just turning 15, it, it hits me like, wow, 15 of those 18 summers are gone. We only got three left. And that, that's, a, that's a big moment to, like, consider, like, am I being generous with my time? I'm making the absolute most of the time that I have now with my kids. Am I pouring into them? Am I being generous with my time? Am I saying I have no time for you? You know, am I being generous with my time with my friends? Like, we all, I think, crave relationship and crave community, but oftentimes we, we aren't generous enough with our time to actually create space to build relationship and make time for friends and make time for family. You know, are we generous with those in need when someone says, hey, I'm, I'm really in a bind, can you help me out? Are we like, yeah, absolutely, I'll be there in a minute. Or are we like, ah, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm really, I'm really, really busy today. Like, can we maybe figure your thing out tomorrow? Like, do we hold up other people's needs because we're super stingy with our time? Are we willing to be generous with our time, recognizing with the principle that the more we give away, the more God will provide what we need in that area. And then we look to, I look to this last one. This is probably my favorite. It's the idea of being generous with our praise. And it's my favorite because it's a double application. You know, we generous with our praise in regards to words of encouragement and words of kindness. You know, think of it. Are you generous with your, with your praise verbally? Or are you stingy with your words of affirmation? We have the ability to speak light into darkness and life into areas that are dead and dying. We need to be generous with our words of praise, generous with our words of encouragement. Or we just, you know, we just never say anything nice. We're never kind. Like, we have the ability to be generous with our verbal praise and really change someone's life, turn their day around, simply by just being generous with the words that we speak. Let's be generous with our words of praise. So generous with our words of praise is one, one application of this idea of being generous with praise. The other is, are you generous with your worship and praise towards God? You know, when we, when we come before our Savior and our King, are, are we generous with our praise and our worship? Or are we holding back? Are we being stingy? You know, if there's, if there's any area, don't hold back in this one. For all that he's done for you, for all that he is doing and will do, for who he is, for the areas he's blessed you and provided for you, you know, he alone is worthy of our praise and worship. So church, be generous in it. Delight in the Lord. Dance before him. Raise a shout of victory. You know, raise your hands as high as they can go as if you're trying to grab hold of heaven itself. Like, don't, don't be scarce in this area. Now is not a time to put your hands in your pockets and just kind of mumble your way through the words and, and think about what's happening in the afternoon. Like, abandon yourself in praise and worship. Be generous with your outpouring of love and affection towards God. There's no loss in that. There's no risk in that. Worship generously. You know, I heard, last week I wasn't here with you in person, but I heard there was a wonderful praise moment as Leanne led us uh, in Make Room. So I believe, like, we, we, are, we are getting, this, getting um, this into our culture, church. We are creating this culture of praise and generous worship. I want to encourage us to continue to press into that. I think the more that we learn how to praise in our own voices, with our own words, the more that we can generously lift up spontaneous praise and worship, really be abandoned in that area, the more we're really just going to see God move powerfully and tangibly in our midst. So I want to encourage us as a church, let's worship generously. Are you starting to get where I'm going here? Do you see how generosity can be applied in, in a variety of different areas? You know, I, gave you, I gave you five this morning. Be generous with your finances. Be generous with your possessions. Be generous with your time. Be generous with praise in regards to what you speak to people. And be generous with praise in regards to your worship and adoration of God. That's just five. There's more, but we're, we're running out of time. But that's five to start with. That's five. Hey, Monday to Friday, next five days, pick one each day and go for it. Just Those are five things you can begin to tangibly work on being generous with. Look for ways to live generously. So like I said off the top, generosity is an area that I feel I have not always excelled at. I can look back, I can call myself out on the fact there have been times when my mindset has been fixed on scarcity and not abundance. So I'm not surprised at all that this is the first topic that God brought to my mind for this summer. I'm not surprised at all. He is pushing me to go deeper in this area. And then as I'm on this journey, articulating it to, to you as the church and to say, hey, as a church, let's, let's go deeper in this area of generosity. We were made for more than shallow. 
And I want to jump into the deep end of all that he has in store for me, both personally and for us as a church. So today that looks like taking the step towards generosity. Remember, giving is an action. Generosity is an attitude. Abundance is a mindset. I am going to choose to be open-handed in every aspect of my life. And I want to encourage us. Let's strive as a church to be open-handed in all things. Let's live our lives so that it can be said of us that we were continually caught open-handed. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are a provider. Thank you that you are the God of infinite resource of abundance and of plenty. Not because you want to hoard things to yourself, but because you want us, your people, to learn what it means to be generous and to live generously so you can begin to get continually resource us to give and to be generous. So I pray right now that you begin to cultivate within the culture of our church a spirit of generosity. You begin to cultivate within the individuals in our church a spirit of generosity. Would you help us, if, we were, if we're struggling in this area, to, to flip the switch in our attitude and to adopt an attitude of generosity? God, I pray that you'd help us to be generous with our money, with our finances. I pray that you'd help us to be generous with our possessions. I pray that you'd help us to be generous with our time. I pray that you'd help us to be generous with the words that we speak in building others up. And I pray that you'd help us to be generous in our praise and our worship of you. And God, I pray that as, as I said, we believe your promises. So God, we believe that as we walk out in a step of generosity, we are trusting that you are going to rush in with provision and blessing because that is what your word says that you will do. So I just pray for a spirit of generosity to get sweep through this place and to take deep root within our midst. God, I just want to pray if there's anybody watching today who, like me, has struggled with the whole scarcity versus abundance mindset, I pray that if anyone here is, is struggling with that, God, you just break that hold of scarcity. You break that lie of scarcity. There's not enough. That you would help those watching to realize that you are the God of abundance, that you are the God of provision, that we don't need to live in a scarce mindset, that we can live in an abundant mindset because that is the consistent promise and descriptor of your character and nature throughout Scripture. So I just pray for those who are struggling with a scarcity mindset, that, this, that the day as they watch that mindset would be broken in the name of Jesus, that their fists would go from closed to open-handed, and they would begin to adopt and walk in and understand the kingdom mindset of abundance. Last thing is this. If you're watching today and you've never made a personal decision to follow Jesus, to have him be a part of your life, I want to give you the opportunity right now. It's as simple as just praying this prayer along with me. So if that's you and you just really feel you make a decision for Jesus, would you pray this with me? Jesus, I, I need you. I recognize that you died on the cross for my sin, that you rose again from the grave victorious so that I can walk in the new life that you have promised me. And Jesus, today, I ask that you would just pour your love into my life, that you'd pour your grace and your mercy into my life. I pray for hope where there is hopelessness. I pray for freedom where there is chains. Jesus, I guess commit my life to you now and, and promise to walk in all the ways you have for me. Amen. If that was you, let someone know. We want to celebrate with you. What an amazing decision you just made. Please reach out. Let someone know. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, any comments, any prayer requests, uh, please let someone on staff know. Call the church office. We love you guys. We care for you guys. We want to just uh, be here for you and support in whatever way we're able to. And we hope to see you again soon. Have a wonderful week, and God bless.